Good evening, this is Asia E-Trading Magazine, I'm Steve Edge. On this week's broadcast, asia Pack traders react to Barclays' dark pool case, China putting options on the table to improve hedging and risk management, flexibility needed on Hong Kong-Shanghai link post-trade to accommodate differing settlement periods, SGX bets fairness will drive revenue in its winning equity trading business, HFT race threatens stability for Asian exchanges as pressure for performance may be driving exchanges to chase fake volumes, and Thai OTC derivatives market set to open up to accredited investors. Good evening and welcome to Asia E-Trading Magazine. On the 25th of June, the New York Attorney General Eric Schneiderman filed a summons to Barclays alleging that it had misrepresented its dark pool activities to increase its market share. The allegations specifically claimed the broker had misled its clients about the amount of predatory behavior taking place in its dark pool. Here we report on the reaction from Asia traders. In Asia, dark trading is only conducted in a few markets such as Japan, Hong Kong and Australia. And as a consequence, the region does not have the same scale of trading in the dark that the US or European markets experience. Ken Rossiter, head of regional Asia-Pacific trading for asset manager Allianz Global Investors, says, Dark pools are easy political targets, but they can be very efficient for institutional clients in cases where the trader wants to trade in size, within the spread, or at the mid-price. In Hong Kong, a consultation on the regulation of alternative liquidity pools was concluded in April 2014 by the Securities and Futures Commission. The main proposals were to introduce a harmonized set of rules across all market operators with their automated trading license and to ban retail order flow from dark pools. As a consequence of these provisions, many buy-side traders feel that the risks in the U.S. are not a threat to wary firms in Asia. Emma Quinn, head of Asia-Pacific Trading at Asset Manager Alliance Bernstein, says, We've always paid a lot of attention to dark pools, and with the Hong Kong Electronic Trading Rules and Australian Securities Investment Commission rules about trading at midpoint, for a lot of people this has been taken care of. However, Japan, which has seen a significant level of market fragmentation across both proprietary trading systems such as SBI Japan, Nex, and Chaix Japan and Dark Pools, has been less responsive than other markets. Tetsuya Wakabayashi, head of trading in Vesco Asset Management Japan, says, Revision of Dark Pool usage is not happening both on the FSA or Japan Exchange Group side. The FSA may consider regulating Dark Pools in Japan, but in the short term we see no action to be taken. Despite the varied efforts of market regulators to manage the risks created by broker dark pool, the alleged deliberate misleading of clients by Barclays has made many buy-side firms nervous. A Singapore-based head of trading at a regional asset manager who spoke on condition of anonymity said that using fixed tags can help because they allow the dealer to track how trades are progressing in venues once they leave a dark pool. The question is now being raised, how do I know that a broker is doing what they say they are doing? There's been a lot more doubt cast on dark pools, he says. Wakabayashi believes that a raised level of caution is reasonable as long as that leads to prudent and proportional action. Here in Japan, after the incident in the U.S., more clients do their due diligence. Clients also ask more questions about how a specific dark pool might work. I believe that dark pools are beneficial venues and view the sell side as partners. In 2012, when the U.S. SEC was reportedly starting its investigation into dark pools, ASIC set up two task forces, one to investigate HFT and another to investigate dark pools on the Australian market. The task force found that it was in fact dark pools rather than high frequency trading that were the chief concerns. We'll hear this report that ASIC is well prepared to deal with dark pools. In a March 2013 paper, the Australian Financial Regular reported that some crossing systems allow or have previous allowed access to their crossing system by clients that the industry widely considers to be high frequency traders while maintaining there is no high frequency trading in the crossing system. In August 2013, a paper written by Will Samadellis, head of Trading Australia at investment management firm Schroeders, and Stuart Baden-Powell, then executive director at brokers RBC Capital Markets, detailed proprietary research by the two firms which indicated that in certain dark pools, there were persistent losses in certain venues more consistent with arbitrage. As a result of its own findings, ASIC released a series of new regulations, the first issued in May 2013, required dark pools to deliver meaningful price improvements on trades while recategorizing block trades as 200,000, 500,000, or 1 million Australian dollars depending on stocks liquidity. Further rules were put in place over a nine-month period from August 2013 to deliver better transparency and execution to the users of dark pools. According to the Australian Securities Exchange, on average around $1 billion Australian dollars of daily turnover, or about 20% of average total turnover, is executed in the dark. And an average of 5.6% of that 20% was being traded on the exchange's own dark pool. 
As one Australian buy side trader puts it, ASIC have been on top of this for years. The Chinese authorities have long held a tight grip on the country's capital markets, restricting the availability of financial instruments and managing limited participation of foreign investors through a quota system. However, Chinese regulators are expected to introduce options trading by the end of the year. As China pushes forward with financial liberalization, regulators are keen to expand investors' capacity to hedge risk. All four of China's futures exchanges, as well as the Shanghai Stock Exchange, have announced launch plans for options trading. Underlyings will comprise equity indices, single stocks and ETFs, as well as commodity futures. Once options are introduced to China, it will further signify the Chinese investment community and regulators' commitment to market developments, says Nick Ronalds, Managing Director and Head of Equities for the Asia Securities Industry and Financial Markets Association in Hong Kong. Ronalds believes options offer a significant opportunity for both the buy and sell side. For the sell side, China is a large but relatively underdeveloped market. There is huge opportunity there. For the buy side, options are a whole new tool for managing investments are attractive to both retail and institutional investors. While Chinese regulators have not provided a confirmed timetable for the launch of options trading, market insiders expect exchange-traded funds options referencing the CSI 300 and the SSE 50 to be launched ahead of equity indices and single stocks. ETFs will serve as the pilot product for the China option market, as from Beijing's viewpoint, it is more difficult to manipulate them. There are a number of regulatory challenges China's new option market will face. For instance, China's current regulatory framework prohibits several option trading strategies, particularly those pertaining to market makers. One example is the 500 cancellation rule, which means market participants can only cancel 500 times per contract per day. Regulators may have some flexibility, though, says Vivian Deng, China chief representative at derivatives agency broker New Edge in Shanghai. We expect the introduction of option contracts could lead to exchange-designated market makers being excluded from the 500-order cancellation rule, she says. The Hong Kong and Shanghai Stock Connect platform is set to launch this October, but post-trade connectivity and processing may hamper interest among traditional investors, according to this report. Trading firms and their post-trade service providers will need to negotiate risk management, quota and price limit issues for the Hong Kong and Shanghai Stock Connect platform. Northbound orders on the pre-trade side will also need to follow local trading rules. Initially, the link settlement cycle worked on a de facto T-1 cycle. As the T plus zero process was not supported by an intraday movement of stock between custodian and broker. As these movements were only settled at 7.30 p.m., the trader would be required to move stock or cash the day before in order to be ready to trade the next day. That in turn exposed the buy side trader to counterparty risk with the broker. Following industry feedback, however, a 7.45 a.m. settlement batch was added to the cycle. Stephanie Morell, head of Hong Kong BNP Paribas Security Services, notes that the China and Hong Kong regulators have shown their commitment in making this project work. The six-month preparation time frame will allow for blips to be ironed out, systems tested and redesigned, rules to be more aligned, and trading structures and processes to be established, she says. The link will mark the first time that international investors can trade Shanghai A shares via the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, while mainland investors will be able to trade Hong Kong A shares via the Shanghai Stock Exchange, subject to quotas both ways. Michael Carburos, head of Business Development Asia Pacific at NASDAQ OMX, believes that most of the foundations have been laid. For Go Live, the following conditions need to be fulfilled. Trading and clearing rules and systems will need to be finalized, and all regulatory approvals need to be granted. Most of the above are already complete, if not well on their way to being completed. As for the Hong Kong exchange market participants, brokers will need to apply for participation, have an account with CCAS, attend mandatory market rehearsals, and be subject to all existing regulation under Hong Kong Security Futures Ordinance. Still ahead on AGE Trading Magazine, SGX bets fairness will drive revenues in its waning equity trading business. HFT raised threatened stability for Asian exchanges as pressure for performance may be driving exchanges to chase fake volumes, and Thai OTC derivatives market set to open up to accredited investors. Welcome back. Recent reforms announced by Singapore's market regulator aim to bolster the exchange's reputation for governance to attract listings as it struggles against failing equity trading volumes. SGX bets fairness will drive revenues in this report. In the latest full-year earnings release for Singapore Exchange, they saw a 4% decline in revenue to 687 million Sing. The drop was driven by a 17.5% decrease in the securities fee revenue to 227 million Sing as the daily average traded value of securities had fallen. SGX is betting on increasing opportunities and hence raising revenues by inducing a culture of fairness. 
Kenneth Ng, head of Singapore Research at CIMB Investment Bank, says, it is often hard to know at what point regulation should be relaxed in order to attract new listings or without threatening the integrity of a stock exchange. Clearly, the Singapore exchange has weighed in with a preference for strong corporate governance and transparency, even at the expense of losing potential listings. The Australian and Japanese regulators are widely applauded by market practitioners for introducing sober, measured rules and refinements. Conversely, many traders and brokers complain about the Hong Kong Securities and Futures Commissions responding disproportionately to immediate events and set rules that are radically applied. The authorities had been reviewing securities market rules since October 1st last year when three small cap stocks plunged and lost millions of dollars in market value. This brought down other small company shares, prompting angry investors to criticize what they saw as an inadequate regulatory regime. The major August reforms are more substantive and are designed to curb speculative trading, reduce credit risks for brokers, and mitigate dangers associated with low price stock. In response to the Bank of Thailand's plan to further relax barriers around capital flows into Thailand, the Securities and Exchange Commission has announced that it will allow mutual funds to invest into derivatives without investment limits. The announcement is the latest in the central banks and SEC's roadmap to develop Thailand's capital markets. In Thailand, derivative investments for mutual funds are restricted hedging transactions up to 100% of the notional value of the underlying. A new ruling by the Securities and Exchange Commission will allow mutual funds to invest in derivatives over 100% of the underlying notional to generate higher returns. Additionally, mutual funds will be allowed into the small and tightly regulated OTC derivatives market in Thailand. It is currently only restricted to certain financial institutions and comprises primarily of foreign exchange and interest rate derivatives, according to data by the Bank of Thailand. According to Napadon Nimampapak, Assistant Managing Director and Head of Equities and Derivatives Trading at Fatra Securities in Bangkok, the new ruling sets the ball rolling on a reform of derivatives rules that will open up the OTC derivatives market. It will also set the stage for a local central counterparty to be established in the country. We still have to clear the rules at the SEC and the Stock Exchange of Thailand and establish the tax implications for investments in these kinds of products. The industry will need to develop a platform for issuers to be able to effectively offer these products to investors before we get into the platform for clearing them, he says. Thailand is not directly a part of the G20, represented instead through the ASEAN. It is not bound to OTC reform as envisioned by the G20 in 2009, which required OTC transactions to be centrally cleared and traded electronically. The SETS Cash Equity Clearing Platform announced its compliance with the principles of financial markets infrastructure by the Committee on Payment and Settlement Systems. Compliance here, however, forms the basis of OTC clearing counterparty regulation globally. Our final story for tonight looks at how the high-frequency trading race threatens stability for Asian exchanges. Pressure for performance may be driving exchanges to chase phantom volumes in this report. Almost every major exchange in Asia has now embraced low-latency, high-volume trading platforms to attract high-frequency traders. The step up in technology has seen exchanges in the region struggle with balancing the speed and stability of their trading platforms, with technical outages becoming a recurring issue in the region's trading landscape. According to David Jenkins, head of business development for Asia at Fidesa in Hong Kong, exchange outages are an expected outcome of the current environment as both trading venues and market participants struggle to manage their operational risk more effectively. There is an evolution that is going through in electronic markets and time will tell how this will bear out. Until then, glitches in the trading infrastructure will be inevitable as we are in an unprecedented technological evolution, he says. The merger of the Osaka Securities Exchange and the Tokyo Stock Exchange has prompted a large-scale revamp of the newly formed Japan Exchange Group's derivatives trading platform JGate to match the high-speed platform in its equities division Arrowhead. Hong Kong Exchange is currently implementing its Orion Technology Initiative. Similarly, the Australian Securities Exchange and the Singapore Exchange have been at the forefront of implementing changes in their trading infrastructure. Stuart Kerr, Singapore-based head of global trading technology at RBS Global Markets, says the current technological arms race may be making trading infrastructures more complex. There is a danger that organizations are buying too many specific products, resulting in the addition of unnecessary complexity to platforms, when what they should be doing is to ruthlessly simplify, he says. Outages in the region have been widespread and across the technology stack, indicating the impact of pressure on the industry as a whole. The OSC's March 2013 outage was due to a fault in the software of JGate. SGX suffered two outages, an error in back office maintenance activity in 2013, and a network hardware issue in 2014. That's our broadcast for tonight. Stay tuned next time when we look at capital restrictions on brokers hampering liquidity in the corporate bond market. The sell side are launching new trading platforms, and we'll hear from the buy side just how far the new platforms go to fulfilling their needs, and how is FATCA affecting trading in Asia. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at Asia eTrading. 
For AGE Trading, I'm Steve Edge. Good night.